Welcome back to Litter Media Live special edition. We have Chillicothe Mayor Luke Feeney with our month of May visit, although the month is almost up. But we're going to be looking forward to what's happening in the month of June, as well as kind of putting a bow on the end of May and some of the events that we've had here in our community. Our special edition today brought to you by Classic Brands, back with Chillicothe Mayor Luke Feeney right after this. Are you looking for a beer that satisfies your thirst and love of country? Armed Forces Brewing Company brews beer for patriots. Celebrate freedom with every sip. Armed Forces Brewing Company. Freedom never tasted so good. I'm Mike Smith, back with Chillicothe Mayor Luke Feeney. Uh, Mayor, uh, we're wrapping up May as we speak live uh, here. Feast of the Flowering Moon just wrapped up on uh, the weekend. How do you think uh, things went there? Well, I think they had great weather. I think... uh you know, it's a it's an event that changes a little bit every year, every year, particularly given how popular downtown downtown has become. Uh, you know, the, before that, a couple of weeks before that, you had uh, Gus Macker, mm-hmm. and uh, what we've tried to do downtown, and what we continue to try to do with with the help of uh, downtown Chillicothe and some other groups, is make sure that those events um, benefit and support the downtown businesses uh, as well as the the people who attend the feast and make sure that the love is spread around a little bit. And so we're always trying to tweak and, and do better. But I think, uh, you know, there weren't any major incidents. Uh, lots of kids had fun. The city pool was also open. So it uh, draws a lot of people downtown into the area. You mentioned the pool opening up uh, at the same time. Uh, I remember it, it usually opened in late May, but I couldn't remember it opening on the same weekend as the feast before. Yeah, I think it's usually Memorial Day weekend. Yeah. I think the thing to me, it seems like this year's Memorial Day seems really early. Mm-hmm. Uh, my kids, for example, uh, have another week of school left. I think they're one of the only schools left that has that. But uh, usually going back after Memorial Day is not a thing. So uh, attention is a little difficult when this, this warm out and that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, we try to get it, you know, it's kind of like the the intro to summer, get the pool open, uh, weather cooperated, although I do think it was a little cold in that pool. But. <laughs> <laughs> you know, speaking of that, um, I'd been seeing some stories uh, on national news where a lot of municipalities, beaches, are having trouble getting lifeguards. Mm-hmm. Is that still a challenge for us as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think this year we're, we did fill up on lifeguards. I think we budget for 15 at the pool. Um, you know, one of the hardest things uh, is that, particularly with the way colleges and universities start this day, uh, this day and age, it used to be more schools were on quarters, which meant you started after Labor Day and you got home around uh, you know, end of May, June. Well, now that kids are starting, and a lot of our um, a lot of our lifeguards are either college students or you know older high school students, and they're they're starting earlier and earlier uh, in the fall or later in the summer, depending how you look at it. And uh, it kind of hurts our workforce there. But uh, we've got a great crew. A lot of people who are coming back um, second and third time, second and third summers, and uh, we're fortunate to have them. But I think it kind of reflects the overall workplace right now, how it's difficult to to keep folks and uh, uh, just kind of a, a modern day and age and, and being prepared in a modern workforce to, to keep people. But those seasonal jobs aren't always so easy, uh, but they are, they are the right fit for a lot of people. Staying in the pool, if we may, for a moment, many of our area communities of comparable size, and I think of Circleville, Washington Courthouse, closed their pools. They filled them in because they couldn't afford to keep them going. Um, where are we financially speaking with the Chillicothe pool and what does the future look like for it? Great question. So uh, you might remember something like eight years ago, um, the, the city pool was a part of the general fund, the way it was funded. And we made the decision uh, to move it into a, a part of parks and recreation. One of the things that that did was make it so that it was a little less controversial every year. Um, and you didn't really look at the pool, and I don't look at the pool as something that has to be a moneymaker. Mm-hmm. Um, there are certain things that we do in city government, uh, much of what we do in city government, we're not trying to make a profit on the taxpayers. We're not trying to make money. Um, the taxpayers are the shareholders. Uh, we're not trying to pay the shareholders back. And so um, when you think about it that way, and you think about, okay, the city pool maybe operates, um, brings in, let's just use round numbers, let's say it brought in $100,000 in revenue last summer, but it cost $120,000. I think most people would say, if you could run a city pool for three months and all these kids and families get to take advantage of it for twenty grand, I think it's worth it. 
the big question for the pool really is the infrastructure. It's, it's an older pool. Uh, actually, this summer, uh, not this summer, this spring, uh, a lot of repairs were done and it was painted. Uh, that helps with the ceiling and water loss. But um, the community is really going to have to make a decision long term about that facility. Over the years, there's been um, really a push from the public, especially the families of people who have swimmers, uh, competitive swimmers, to uh, have more of a, an aquatic center in the community. Mm -hmm. You know, the Y has a nice indoor pool. Um, but I know that in terms of uh, competitive capacity and attracting people, uh, you would need something bigger. And so I think that that's something that the community have to make a decision on sometime is at some point that city pool is going to take quite a bit of investment. And the question will be, does it stay what it is or, or does it change to the future? I think that's an exciting thing. I think being able to hang on to an asset like that um, has been really good for our community. All you have to do is drive down there on a Saturday oh, or yeah. a weekday and see how many people get to take advantage of a good, healthy, safe uh, activity. Well, I think many members of our audience who may be younger or maybe moved into the community may not be aware that many, many years ago, when that pool was put in, it was to, it was in response to a loss of lives, plural, people, young pe people swimming in the river, right. which is not safe. Right. Yeah. If you can save one life uh, and like, you know, circling back to those lifeguards that we have that are so good. Um, it really is, uh, you know, for a lot of kids and families, you know, the, the best and healthiest outcome for, for a summer. And uh, uh, we're happy to be able to provide it. Looking ahead into the month of June, some big events that are coming up. Of course, we had a big celebration parade for Kenworth Truck last year because their, uh, their uh, company was celebrating a centennial. But this summer will be the 50th anniversary of the Chillicothe plant. Yeah, I, I can't wait. If you have not been to that parade, I, you know, I would have loved to have seen the look on my face that first year because it, it, it is just so cool. Wow. <laughs> and so to get to celebrate uh, the 50th this year, uh, if you have not been, bring your family down. It's a great event. Uh, my kids love it. Uh, just the enthusiasm from, and for those that don't know, you know, truck owners from around the country bring in their own personal trucks. Um, and it's really a special event. And I, I'm glad it's become a, an annual event in Chillicothe. It's a lot of fun. Of course, when you've been around 50 years, 100 years, like the paper mill, even though the paper mill has changed ownerships over the year, it's, it's still here in Chillicothe. You think of the millions and millions of dollars that have come into our community, not only in payroll, but taxes and et cetera. Uh, sometimes when you've been around that long, you, you get taken for granted. And we don't ever want those companies to feel like we're taking them for granted. We appreciate them. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. I think um, you know, being able to celebrate with Kenworth is a pretty neat thing. And, you know, the paper mill just plugs away down there and, uh, you know, is still the largest employer in the city. Um, Kenworth and the hospital outside of city limits. Um, but all three of them, you know, make up sort of the triumvirate of really big mm -hmm. anchor tenants to this, to the city and the community. And, you know, all three of them are, um, very, uh, philanthropic too. Um, and the, the amount that they give back to the communities is very much appreciated. Of course, there are things that go on behind the scenes that Joe citizen may not always know about, but your office, the commissioners, uh, CIC, groups like that are always working and talking to other potential industry or businesses about, hey, come into Chillicothe. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, the, the, the role that I sit in and the role of others in the community, um, you know, the, there's the day-to-day -day potholes, uh, but then there's the long-term relationships, conversations, uh, and addressing of the needs of some of these companies, trying to, trying to bring folks in. Uh, and sometimes that, that's what separates, really separates communities. Because you look at communities and say, well, what is it about this community that they have so many of these things? A lot of it has to do with the people and the relationships that help to attract them or keep them. Um, and other, not every community has that. And then we've seen a lot of communities. You know, um, I've been told that uh, to the west, Fayette County, you know, their property there that is going to be the, the battery uh, plant, mm -hmm. they were working on getting those properties together for a potential site like that for 20 years. Yeah. And so that work takes a long time and a lot of conversations, um, but it makes, it makes a difference for generations to come. And they missed out on a previous automaker that they hoped to get into there. Well, some communities might have just thrown their hands up and said, well, let's just 
forget all this. Well, they kept persisting and finally got this EV plant. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the acreage that you have to have together, being able to find that type of acreage and then working with uh, the state government, uh, local officials, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, and, you know, I think that I think that that effort is also often under the radar, like you said, but but so important. Another story, and you may not be able to, to comment much on this. Uh, we ran a story about the, uh, the the Port Authority. Their first meeting was held the other day. It was just intended to be an informational meeting to let the public know this. is, And a lot of people commented, well, here's just another entity that's going to tax us. Could you lay out a little bit of an explanation of why does a Port Authority located in a community like this. Sure. Well, I think the first and most common reaction, myself included, is what port is this? Yeah. Is this, this is the, <laughs> the port the of the port Sia- 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, We're going to have lots of big boats coming in. But I think, you know, you mentioned the CIC earlier, which is the, the Community Improvement Corporation. That is an organization created under Ohio law, just like the land bank is. And the port authority fits into that category as well. And each of them have specific abilities to do certain things. And I think the concept with the Port Authority is the ability, uh, whereas the CIC, for example, under Ohio law, can't borrow money. Um, sometimes uh, pr- building projects especially uh, need different types of uh, help. Uh, so if we're trying to attract a company, I think the concept was that the Port Authority might be able to be an agency that could issue debt um, and then be able to help support projects. Mm -hmm. Um, Lawrence County, for example, uh, down in Ironton, uh, they have a very robust port authority uh, that almost works like a public side developer um, and gets, uh, you know, creates spec buildings, Mm -hmm. uh, leases them, creates uh, jobs for the community. And so I think it'll be interesting to see how ours sort of pans out because I think for every community, they play sort of different roles. Uh, and we'll see if there's any new barges or anything like that floating down the river anytime soon. Well, any of us that have driven north towards Columbus, whether you're going up uh, 23 or 104, you see these massive warehouses that are going in. Much of that has been under what has been known as the Rickenbacker Port Authority. Well, that brings jobs. And I know about seven to 10 years ago, we did an interview with the Pickaway County Commissioners when I was at the radio station. And they were hoping that eventually that that Port Authority could lead to as many as 20,000 jobs in this area. And isn't that what we're talking about? Yeah, I think that's realistic. I think that you know, you see uh, these these uh, buildings that are springing up overnight, um, and you know, you you hear about the support needs of Intel and that sort of thing. And so, um, realistically, we might be behind in the creation of the Port Authority and these these sorts of agencies and organizations. But it's incumbent on, upon the government and leaders to create these entities to be ready, because uh, oftentimes what it is is sometimes you have to have a plan, but sometimes you just have to be able to be nimble enough to move quickly when the opportunity presents itself. And I think that that's what um, they've done in that creation is maybe they're not going out to borrow money or issue debt today, um, but when the right project comes along, they'll be ready to do it. And that's a big deal. Something we want to touch on real quick before we close, uh, even though it's not for another month away, uh, 4th of July fireworks, we still want people to know that the, um, the rotary is going to be involved in, in that again, putting that on, and they are taking donations yep. for the fireworks. Yep. So we decided a few years ago, you know, Noon Rotary, um, very community-minded organization, uh, and really just asked us how they could help with fireworks. They did some of the fundraising of their, on their own and just contributed to the city. And then we had a conversation where they were just completely willing to really take on the big lift of fundraising, make the asks for the city because – you know, realistically, the city collects tax dollars and fees and we get your water bills and that sort of thing. So so going out and asking to fundraise too, we weren't the most comfortable in that. So Noon Rotary has really helped and that's what's really cranked uh, the fireworks up the last couple of years to, to really an 11 out of 10 because I think the last couple of years we've been over $50,000 uh, and for years before that it was around $15,000. And so, uh, yeah, you can, you can send a contribution directly to the city. You can send it through Noon Rotary. Um, either one will get to the right place. Um, and you know, the nice thing too, is that what goes in excess of the 50 can be held for the next year because it's a nonprofit that's, that's doing it. And so 
a little bit of a base for the, f- the future year uh, is, is good for us too. And so I think it's going to be another great, um, great night. And again, you know, you talk about uh, just the events, the things happening downtown. You have the feast. This coming weekend is Brewfest. And then you have the, the truck parade and uh, the 4th of July. And uh, I think to some extent, uh, you know, it brings a lot of people downtown and hopefully pe- people back. But there's a stretch of May to June where there's something almost every weekend. And uh, downtown's really doing well right now. But we have to balance it out, make sure there's still parking and ways to get to these shops where people are, are having fun uh, celebrating 4th and other events. And if you really want to see the mayor at his best, come out and watch him play baseball this weekend. <laughs> Old vintage baseball. Best, yeah, <laughs> that's right. No, glo- wait, no glove, right? I think that we you know, rubberized ball. Uh, it's it's something to behold. I wouldn't say at my best, but it's something to now behold. Now there's a double header. You'll be at the one at the VA. Correct. Yeah. yeah. You you hold out for the big stadium. That's right. That's right. I only play in big stadiums. <laughs> he don't he don't do the backyard thing up at the Adena. He wants the stadium set up. It should be a good weekend. And, you know, that's another thing to celebrate. 100 years, mm-hmm. uh, it's the VA centennial this weekend. And so there'll be a lot of people out of the VA, a lot of people at the ball game, and uh, just just a lot a lot good going on right now. I won't say break a leg. That's for the <laughs> theater only, not for athletics. <laughs> Mayor, we'll see you in late June. Thanks so much. Again, Chillicothe Mayor Luke Feeney, our guest on a special edition of Litter Media Live, brought to you by Classic Brands. I'm Mike Smith.